So who's heard me talk before, by the way? Some of you. Who hasn't? Okay, and who has but wish they hadn't? So some of those in the... Okay, clients at the back raising their hands. Okay, cool. So we're going to talk about these very simple concepts, the brick walls and the valleys of death. And it's, this is a, a business context rather than agency. There's plenty of agency experts here on lettings and estate agency. Talk to those guys today. Pick up the little bits and pieces that you need to take away to your business. What I specialise in is helping people... Um, turn a busy job into an asset that works for them. That's really what I do. So uh, this is me out in Peru. I like to travel around the world when I can. Um, that was a couple of years ago. We did Australia this year, going out into the outback. So that's the type of stuff I like to do when I'm not working with clients. Um, but I'm a coach. So my question to you, just nod. You don't need to raise hands. Is it OK with you if I can coach you for the next hour until lunchtime? Is that okay? All the people nodding don't know what they're getting into. All the clients are keeping their heads firmly still because they know what it's like. Right, Lewis? Yeah. Okay. So I had a chat with Lewis the other day on the phone. Do you want to just briefly share what was your feedback to me at the end of that call? How did you say you felt? What was that W word? Do you remember? Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember saying you felt really weird? Yeah. So what happens is we all carry baggage on our shoulders, whether we know it or not. And you hear the figures of people talking about life's burden weighs on our shoulders. And when you can put it down, it feels really weird because you're not used to it. You feel lighter as a result. So what I'm going to try and do in the next hour is help you feel lighter. Would that be cool? But to do that, you've got to embrace and engage with the content. I want to shout at you and make your hands go up and down. What I actually want to do is get you talking on your tables. Because I think for the type of people we've got in the room, that's probably going to suit you better. If you want to shout out and raise your hands and stuff like that, great, bring it on. We'll handle whatever happens. But otherwise, I really want you engaging on your tables. When I ask you questions, think about it together, help each other, and then let's share. And some of you be more brave than others about what you share, and that's cool. All right? So if everybody just does their best for them, that will be perfect. OK. What do you think is the hardest thing in general? doesn't matter whether you're an estate agency owner, a lettings agent owner. In fact, any business, in my experience over the past 10 years, what is the hardest thing to master? On your tables, what do you think? One minute, what's the hardest thing to master? Who can hear the duck? Can anybody hear the duck? Oh, you can hear the duck? Yeah? So if you've got, if you've got an iPhone, you can actually... Shut up, duck, thank you. Um, you can actually set all kinds of amusing tones with your stopwatch and your countdown timer. So when you hear the duck... That's like, OK, you've had, your, you've had your minute now. What came up on your tables? Time. Time? Time? Back table? Steve? Say again? OK. Prioritizing? Time and delegation? Time. That's really interesting. This is what I find it is. Time. <laughs> what is it? What's happening in the room here? Are you blocking the staff? <laughs> um, I don't think either of those are me. Do you um, have to inspire your staff? No. Motivate them? No. Listen to the staff. I'm not listening to... One of those is not actually a member of the staff yet. It's recruitment. <laughs> when I start with people... There's a wide range of OK. If yours is time, that's OK. What we find is, how do you know that you've got an A player in front of you before you hire them? How do you know? It's difficult. 
And I find with clients, we very often have to go through the mill and start again. And they think, oh, I'm terrible, I'm, you know, all that negative stuff. No, no, you're learning. And what happens is, as you guys invest in yourselves, you end up leaving the B players behind. So really, really tough. One of the major frustrations is how do I get the people around me? It's not just you. You have to obviously work on yourself as a leader, like Matt was talking about. You also have to find the right people and get them to engage with your business. <coughs> Let's talk about the second one, knowing which way to go. Many industries are facing huge pressures, such that many of the players in those industries no longer exist. You don't have to look at your high street to know that. They didn't anticipate change. They didn't update their business model. And that's happening in your industries too. Look at the changes the government's inflicting on the buy-to-let sector. Yeah, so how are you adapting your businesses, your business model first? So we understand what a business model is. If you had to draw your business on paper and explain what inputs go into it, what happens in the middle and what's the output, could you actually draw that? and show how it leads you to making money, and show how it's robust against the future. Because most people don't even think about that. They just think, well, I'm a letting agent, or I'm a estate agent, this is what I do. But what are the variants on those things you should be thinking about? Who, for example, thinks right now is a brilliant time to be doing acquisitions? Yeah, right, because why? Because a lot of people are losing their heads, right? If you're smart and you anticipate it earlier, <laughs> When did you first hear John Paul talking about the tenant fee ban and work, going through his whole business to work out how to compensate those fees? Two years ago? Yeah, exactly. So do you think he's scared about it? And yet who hasn't actually done anything yet? So knowing your direction, yeah, it feels lonely, but reach out and ask if you're not sure. But these are the common frustrations. Let's talk about another one. Anybody had a bad hair day? Yeah? What does it the military say? That uh, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. And in business, no plan survives the nine o'clock opening of your business, right? Because something cropped up and everything changes. But how many people actually don't actually have a plan? I've been talking with clients. They're, they're used to the fact that they have one as the CEO and then they want the next level down to have one and the next level down to have one so that everybody actually knows how they fit. Matt was talking about having a vision, having a purpose. How do I connect with that purpose if I haven't got a plan to do so? And was I actually engaged in creating that purpose so I understand it's mine even though I'm an employee in the business? So these things are really, really important. And when it, the last one of the four is execution, making it happen. How many of you have got employees that look like this on a Monday morning? <laughs> oh, 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 I just, you know, just need to warm up a bit. I need to have a cup of coffee or check things on social media. On the other hand, how many of you is that on a Monday morning? And how are you infecting your employees with your own mindset and the way you behave? Yes, yeah, so if we think about the big four, let's just write them down because we'll refer to them. If you want to scale up your business, those are the first three. What do you think the last one is? And I'll put time in execution, by the way. Time to get things done. What's the, what's the last one? Be brave, have a guess. Motivation. Sorry? Motivation. Motivation? Results. results. I think results on the right lines. Outcome. Who wants just to know what the answer is? Would that be easier? <coughs> Who's ever been like this in their business before? Yeah. Thank you. Tough sometimes, isn't it? And yet you can't really say that socially. You've got to tell everybody everything's fine. Does anyone know what fi that FIND is an acronym? Yeah? I'll t you can imagine what the F stands for. Yeah, the second one is insecure, and the NE is neurotic. 
So if you add it all up, yep, up, insecure, and neurotic, that's what fine stands for. Because often this is going on behind the scenes. And what surprises me with clients is, there's one guy I was working with, he's actually an upholsterer. And he said, um, I think I'm making money, but I haven't got any money. What's happening to it? And uh, so I sat down with him, and I started building a profit and loss account, really simply. And when I'd finished, didn't take long, I said, well, I think you're making about £10,000 a month. Um, and he goes, well, where's it going? I said, uh, well, what credit card debt have you got? What overdraft have you got? What and by the time we worked out all his debts, that was where the money was going. So he goes, oh, I'm making ten grand a month. Yeah, but you've got to pay off your debts first. But once your debts are paid off, you'll be making £10,000 a month. But he had no idea. And what I find is if I sit down with a client and go through the expense, you know when your accountant gives you your accounts and you've got your sales at the top, which is what most people look at, then they skip to the bottom, which is net profit, right? But in between is called expenses. And you can look at each single line, and in a bigger business, in my teams used to give one person responsibility for each line. And yes, the finance director's name came up a lot. But there's other people too. And in your business, if it's a small business, that person will be you. When did you last negotiate your phone contracts, your broadband, all the contracts you have? When did you last look at them? When did you talk to a mate around these tables? Oh, what do you do to so-and-so? How do you spend that? What does this cost you? We drilled out, I think one business had 30,000 a month of expenses, and we drilled out 10,000 pounds of expenses just by looking. Now, you guys, most of you are detail people. That probably won't happen with you, but there will be something there. And the way I look at money is like this. When my wife used to be a nurse, she used to earn 10 pounds an hour. So when I buy something for 10 quid, that's an hour's work for her. That's how I used to think about it. I used to keep my feet on the ground. When you have that attitude, then you say, right, every 100 pounds I save, I can take her out for dinner. Every 250 pound, I can take her out for the weekend. What's your measure? Have a chat on your table. What's your measure of what money means to you? What simple thing would actually get you to pay attention to those little lines that add up to thousands of pounds. On your tables, have a think about it. What would help you do that? Having enough money. I want enough money to be able to do what I want when I want rather than being in a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Let's that countdown. Thanks, guys. That's a minute. There we go. Good. He's off now. What did you learn? What did you learn from somebody in your chats around the table? Portugal. <laughs> Poetry in Portugal. Yeah. So that's what you want to invest your savings in? Yeah. Yeah, cool. I want to sit somewhere and just inspire myself. Yeah, so write it down. Yeah, yeah. Stick it on the wall. Right. Make it real. Fantastic. Anybody else got something they want to share? No, okay. Oh, right at the back. Oh, hold Excellent. On. Being able to spend at least one weekend a month in my house in Scotland, I haven't seen it since Easter. Right. Yeah. So put a picture of that house in Scotland on the wall in the office. Yeah, for any of you, if you want to make it real, bring it into your head by getting it there. Uh, guys, th this shit Sorry. works, by the way. I just want to just say this. It sounds really weird and wacky, but trust me, it works. Yeah? Give me a five and eight to me. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so just manifest the stuff by making sure it's in your mind. If you want a simple example, there's two things. One, don't think of a blue elephant. Who's heard this one before? Don't think of a blue elephant. What happens? Think of a blue elephant, right? Because you, you don't recognize the word don't. You just think of the subject. This is why worrying is praying for what you don't want. You have to switch to what you do want. So if I've got a beautiful house in Scotland and I want to go to, I want that picture on the wall, I want it in front of my face, I want it on my screensaver, on my phone, because it's reminding me the reason why I'm working hard is to get to that place. And then that's what I'm thinking of, I'm not thinking about my worries. Does this make sense? And I once had a client, new client, loads of worries, and I said to her, look, just calm down, we'll take a piece of A4 paper, fold it in half vertically, 
So on the left-hand side, I want to write all your worries down. I thought, oh, take a couple of seconds, no problem. 20 minutes later, she was still writing. She was on the fourth piece of paper. I was like, whoa, okay. Um, right, on the right side, I want you to write the opposite. She didn't, had no idea what the opposite was. She was so locked into worrying, she couldn't figure it out. So I worked through a couple of examples of what the positive would be. I said, right, now you've got that to do, do that exercise. That took her an hour because she just wasn't used to it. And I said, so when you look at the left-hand side, how do you feel? What do you think she said? The worries. When she looked at all that, how do you think she felt? What do you think? Worried. Yeah, terrible. How do you think she felt when she looked at the positive side? Come on. Worried. Really good. <laughs> right? Because you're immersed in the bad, you feel bad. You're immersed in the good, you feel good. I said, so what do you need to do? She goes, focus on the right-hand side. I said, yeah, exactly. You think this is crazy? This works. When I'm working with the really big chief executives, they all have a script. The script is them at their best. So part of the exercise I do with them, I, give me the top achievements of your life. Who are you when you are doing those things? Do this for yourselves. Write this down. This is gold, right? Who are you when you're at your best? In your business, in your life, who are you? What were you doing? What was happening? How did you feel? You write this stuff down, maximum one sheet of paper, one side, when you get into the office in the morning, you pick that piece of paper up and you read it to yourself. This is who I am. At the end of the day, you pick it up again. Was I this person today? To what degree, what mark out of ten do I give myself for being the best that I can be? And what you find is you start to stay on track. It's like a habit. Don't beat yourself up when you have an off day. We're humans. Let it go. Focus on, okay, I had an off day today. I know why. Tomorrow's another day. It's going to be better. Use this stuff to manage your state. Manage your state. It's probably the most precious thing that you have. Okay. So, point is, I don't want you doing this. Who's ever given the puppy dog eyes to somebody before? Oh, it's all terrible. I'm stuck. I don't know what to do. What's the antidote to this kind of thing, by the way? Anybody? Come on, I've got a smile on the middle table. Chainsaw, yeah. <laughs> what are you thinking? Push yourself. I would say take the smallest positive step that you can take. But do something, an action of any kind, is the antidote to this kind of feeling. And every time you take the step, make sure you write it down what you've done. Because as you look at your to-do list, or whatever you call it, and you see the ticks, you start to feel better. We all have tough times. Yeah, I'm not going to bore you with my story, but if you want to ask me later, you can. We all have those troubles in life. It's, it's a question of, what, is it, what did Rocky say? It's how, you, how hard you get back up, not how hard you fall. So true. So, we had, uh, I think Matt mentioned this one, fear of loss of control. Now, for letting agents in particular, why do letting agents in particular fear loss of control? Why is it so paralyzing? Okay, on your tables, one minute till the duck quacks. Why do letting agents in particular fear loss of control? If you saw the video with Christopher and myself doing DISC, you should know the answer. If you, if you don't, watch, well, you can't watch the video now. Watch it later. But have a chat on your tables, just a minute. Why do letting agents in particular fear loss of control? Okay, we've got the duck, folks. Stop, that's it. Okay, we haven't had much from the back right table. Guys, what was your discussion? What was your, what was your discussion? What did, you, what did you come to? What conclusions did you come to? Personality. Personality? Okay. Anything specific inside that? Yes. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else had anything different to that? 
Fairly self-explanatory? Okay, cool. So if you look at the <coughs> things we've had so far, so the last one here, we call it cash. So for your businesses, maybe for you as an individual, which one of these four is the most relevant to you right now? Rather than discuss it, maybe just make a note for yourself on your, on your notepad if you've got one in front of you. Which one of these four is the most important for you? And then we'll, we'll cr crack on. Just give 10 seconds, just write one of the words down. And we'll go on. Everybody got something? Yeah? Cool. So, one of, one of the things I've been doing with clients over actually the last 30 years is what we call devolving leadership. Getting leadership down to the lowest possible level. Back in the mid-1980s, the manufacturing sector was under huge pressure against being shipped overseas. And the only thing we had to do to compete was we had to massively cut costs and we had to massively ramp up our productivity and cut our lead time. So virtually everything had to change. And in those days, we were turning around manufacturing businesses. And actually, the one I worked in back then is still actually alive and kicking today, which is amazing, a uh, diesel uh, technology company. But one of the things we did in that company was take out layers of management and create leadership opportunities for everybody. So who knows, this is obviously Winston Churchill, but who, which leader gave, had the quote about when given the opportunity, lead? Anybody know who that was? American opposite number? Slightly more modern, Roosevelt. Roosevelt, yeah. Yeah, when given the opportunity, lead. So the question is, when you have the opportunity in your business, are you being the leader? And what opportunities do you create in your own business for people to learn to lead? And why is that important? Do you think people come to work to be told what to do? It definitely does. It definitely does. I'm going to talk to you in a minute about um, a business that's doing this and the impact it's starting to have. Just think about what opportunities, if you had to mark yourself out of 10 as a leader, what, would, what score would you give yourself? Not to share, just to benchmark yourself. And then think about your average employee, what would their score be? And what could you do to shift it? We'll have another round table um, session in a second. So we'll go through these. Next one, setting direction. How many people do you involve in your own business in your planning? and determining your own strategy. Do you involve all of them? Or do you involve only the top team? And what's the appropriate way to engage them? It's amazing when you've put the whole team in the room what they can achieve and how they come out. It's not just motivational, it's inspirational because they take away the ownership and they want to deliver. Every time I've been involved in a situation where we empower employees in this environment, what do you think they want to do? They've given the opportunity, what do they want to prove? What do we think? Go on. They can do it. Yeah. They want to prove that they're right. Because how many times in the past did they get to voice an opinion and be heard? Not many. So what generally happens, this is the typical model of employment, okay? It's really simple. This is a gender-free uh, person, by the way, I'm about to draw here. All right? That's it. Is anything wrong with that diagram? Pardon? No, there isn't. The human brain is the most amazing organ. Yeah, when you wake up in the morning, it automatically switches on. Because if it didn't, you'd struggle to get out of bed, right? But then it only switches off when you get to work. Which is not really very good if you guys are the employers and these are the people you've got as employees. So it's really important. If you're paying for the whole body, you've got you've to engage this bit, not just these bits. In the old days, when markets were stable, 
and you had one guy cracking the whip at the top, it typically was a guy, just want you to do what you're told, fine, if that's the, that's the kind of ego you've got driving the business, but it's not going to get the best result because all those people are going to be figuring out how to get their own back. And believe me, there's an amazing number of fiddles in, in old industry when I was growing up. Some of them incredibly imaginative, but at the business's expense because the business was only using the arms and legs, wasn't using these, so these went off and found other things to do. Crazy if that's your expense and if you're in a small business. Okay, let's go to the next one. A players, my favourite subject. How many of your team are really self-engaged A players? When you give someone a task, do they say, well, I wasn't really sure how to do it, but you were out, so I had to go anyway, and this is what I've done, what do you think? Or do they go, well, I wasn't really sure what to do, so I thought I'd wait until you got back. And if you had to, by law, sack all your employees, how many would you take back on? These are serious questions, because right now, you're carrying cost and lack of performance because you don't want to deal with the problem. And generally, every, everybody knows who the, let's say, not the rotten apple, but the less good ones are. What do those less good ones do to all the good people in your business? Drag them they drag them down. Because I've heard people tell me, why should I work hard when so-and-so isn't doing anything? Why won't the boss do anything about it? I can't really say, well, your boss is so stupid, he doesn't realise that that person isn't working. Yeah? But it just pulls everybody down. So when you have a quiet moment, list all your employees out on a piece of paper and just write, would you rehire that person tomorrow? And if you wouldn't, why wouldn't you? Does that person need help? Do they need to develop? Do they need training? Or is it an attitudinal problem that they, it's just not going to work? And actually they're unhappy and the best thing you can do for them as well as you is actually move them on and let them give them an opportunity elsewhere. And if you don't believe that bit about the better for them, I've had texts from ex-employees telling me how much better they are in a different environment. That, that job wasn't suited to them. It was the right thing to happen. So by keeping them on, you're actually denying them a better future for themselves, not just for you. So it's really important that paths meet when you're employed and then they part at some point. It won't be when you retire. It'll be sometime sooner. But be proactive in dealing with that. So I, said, I think I said it earlier, when I first get in with clients, that's one of the first questions I ask. Who's, who are you carrying? Who do you need to put down and let go? And who needs help? Who, needs, who do you want to develop into the next generation of leaders? And on the cash side, if money isn't your thing, and for some of us it isn't, for goodness sake, hire at least a bookkeeper to help you. If you've got a bigger business, bring in a financial controller. There's loads of people out in the market who, do, who will do an interim finance director's role for you or a part-time FD, whatever you call them. Make sure they're going through the numbers for you if it's not your thing so you are educated. You might not only need to employ them part-time for a year until you've got the hang of it. Or you might decide, I don't like numbers, but I need the information, so I'll pay that person to deliver it for me. When we're talking about paying people, what's the difference between a typical business owner and a real entrepreneur? in regards to work. Anybody heard this one before? So if a business owner finds a job that needs doing, what do they typically decide to do? They, right, exactly that. Yeah, the business owner will do it themselves. What happens to their personal capacity at that point where they make that decision? It disappears. Now they can't do anything else because they've just given themselves a job to do. So it's really important when you crack through that wall, which we're coming to, that when you find a job that needs doing, find somebody to do it. Don't do it, give it to yourself, because you've now then stolen your own capacity. You now can't do anything else because you're busy. Show a classroom picture. But actually what leadership is, it's actually about being consistent, relentless repetition of the vision of the message. One of the things we hear from employees that don't know what's going on, they don't know what the boss, all that kind of stuff, you've got to be getting the communication out there regular as clockwork. That means daily, by the way, in case you didn't know. 
So we're talking about strategy. People say, oh, I'm, I'm a letting agent. Um, you know, this is my USP. But actually, is this a roar of approval from your customers, or is it a yawn of disinterest? Yeah? So who's heard of Andy Bounds, by the way? No? Wrote a brilliant book called The Jelly Effect. And The Jelly Effect talks about what are your afters? What are your afters? You need to know what your afters are because they're what you leave your customers with once you've finished, i.e. afterwards. So rather than say, I'm a coach, I turn your job into an asset because an asset is the afters. When you think about yourself as a letting agent, what do you do? Do you give landlords a good night's sleep? Do you help people fulfill their dreams if you're an estate agent? What, what, what are your afters? Think about that, because when you're making all these community videos and things, you can't be saying, oh, we're Blogs & Co. Because what the customers hear is, well, that's the same as the other Blogs & Co and the other Blogs & Co. What, what's the difference? They can't tell. You ever speak to an accountant? Oh, I'm an accountant. Well, they all are, so how can I tell the difference? I can't refer you if I don't know the point of difference. So really think about what is your point of difference. And if you don't know, talk to your team, talk to your customers. Ask them to tell you why they use you. You'll be surprised sometimes what they say. And maybe this is a great little picture to, to illustrate the point. Yeah? Two letting agents. How can the customer tell them apart? Which one is you? Doesn't matter, right? Because they're the same. Don't be the same. When you are the same, what happens? What becomes the determinant of doing business if you're the same? Yeah, it's the price. Don't be the same. Be different. Who's seen the estate agent in the shower? Who's seen the estate agent in the swimming pool, Adam? <laughs> be off two big brand name estate agencies to get a property that was outside of his normal market because he wanted it. So he said to the, to the owner, I'll jump in that swimming pool if you give me this listing. And they're like, what? And he did it. How many thousand views did you get? Right. Right, be different. Now, this one I will take the credit for. This is Cottrell's Law. That your growth rate cannot exceed your pulse rate. Your growth rate cannot exceed your pulse rate. You might, what, what's the pulse rate in my business? Um, this is about the speed at which things happen. If you only check up on something annually, how long is it before you find out if something's gone wrong? Too long. Yeah, it's a year, isn't it? And I found in my corporate world, when I was running teams, if I had a monthly meeting, everything miraculously took a month to get done. I had this funny idea one day. What if I had the meetings every two weeks? And things took a fortnight. I thought, blimey, I wonder if I have them weekly, what will happen? What do you think happened? Things got done in a week. So you have to think about on what frequency do things need to happen in your business. And once you set those frequencies in the diary, in the calendar, you make them appointments, they happen. Don't override your appointments by telling me evaluation is more important. You'll kill the pulse rate. Have we get that? Okay. And who's got war rooms in their business? The stuff on the wall? Yeah, one or two. Okay. And the first thing to do with estate agents, how many valuations do you want to get this month? Let's say it's 30. Great. First of the month is zero. You haven't got one today, have you? Yeah, I've got whatever. Okay. And that's 30. Great. Straight line. Brilliant. Are you ahead or below every, every day? And they love it. Why? Because they can see it visibly. There's always that pressure. Call the database. Do something. What are we going to do today to get above the line so that by the end of the month we've set the valuations we want? When I was working with Matt first, he took the team. That was the first month. They hit 30, uh, I think 30 listings in a month. I think they'd done 27 before. An average value sale of three grand. That was a 9,000 benefit to the business. How are you going to celebrate? Well, the girls are going to go to the spa and the boys are going to go to the football. I think it cost Matt 300 quid. 
to make £9,000. It's a pretty good deal, right? What are you missing out on by not having that stuff visible? They can't engage if they don't know what you want them to do. So have the war room in your business. Plot what you need to plot. Plot the pipeline, the sales pipeline. Show what's happening in your uh, lettings business. What are the move-ins this month? Yeah, what landlord prospecting are you going to do? Who's in the pipeline? What, what properties have you got to go and see and list? You need to know that stuff and your team need to know. So, now we're rattling through. What do you need to do from what you've seen? Think about the, three, uh, the four strategy things. Is it team? Is it strategy? Is it execution? Is it cash? What you, which is the key one for you? By all means, grab me over lunch if you want to talk about it. So, the brick walls. Everybody's got to do it. First brick wall, hiring somebody. Don't be the business owner, be the entrepreneur. If your business can't expand beyond one person, you're just self-employed. My chairman always says, if you can afford half a wage, take the person on, because they'll earn you the other half. But you've got to have a systemized recruitment process to make sure you only hire the A player. Don't hire the underdog that needs your help. Right? You're not a charity, you're a business. Give to charity once you've made money. The second brick wall is addressing the fear, is when you're like this, trying to stay in control of your business and you're trying to touch everything as Paul was. And what happens is that tension causes, causes stress. Yeah? So you don't, you're not very well, your business isn't very well, you can't invent more time. So at the second brick wall, you have to have grown the leaders up to take the business further forward for you. And the simple thing is routine. Why don't people do routine things routinely? Why do we think? Graham, got a thought? Yeah, exactly that. It's boring. But the main thing is people don't schedule it. That's why. If someone's got problems, I want to look at their diary. Okay, so you're telling me you're not getting enough business in. There's no sales appointments. Why are you doing things and stuff other than sales? Or it's out of control. How many control meetings do you have? I don't have any. So think about what is the lack in your business. Look at your diary and go, well, what have I actually organized? What have I put into my diary to deal with that problem? And sometimes it really is that easy. I had a client I was wrestling with for two years to get them to have this bloody on the business time. They'd done it for about a month and they said, well, we discuss all this stuff at our meeting now. We don't need this weekly coaching thing. I said, right, but it's taken you two years to do what you're bloody told. That's not coaching, that's mentoring. But the point was, they realized that I've been trying to push them in that direction, but the resistance was up here. When they finally cracked it, now I just see them once a month for board meetings. So they're able to manage it themselves. They don't want dependency. That's not what it's about. I can't free people to fly themselves if I keep hold of the controls. Yeah, same applies to me as it does to you. Okay, this is a bit of a fun slide. Who's this lady? Close, Club Classics, you're on the right line. German band called Snap, she's actually American. What was the, what was the song? If, I'd, uh, if I was smart enough technolo technologically, there would be a little soundtrack in here. Who remembers Rhythm is a Dancer? Yeah? The reason I say that to you is hopefully you're getting, the <laughs> getting your clogs on. <laughs> Did you know it? Good man. The point here, what's the point about rhythm? Talk about pulse, the rhythm of things happening in your business. Please do that. Daily huddles, weekly sales meetings, monthly P&L, weekly cash flow. Those are the sort of things that should be happening. Put them in concrete in your diary. And if a client wants to meet you at, an, at a time where you've got those meetings scheduled, what do you say? It's not, I'm in a meeting, by the way. I'm with a client. I'm really sorry, I'm with a client at that time. Now, clients understand that clients are important. 
So that is the only excuse that makes sense. If you say I'm in a meeting, well, I'm a client. Aren't I more important than a bloody meeting? Of course you are. So tell them you're with a client at that time. Could I possibly see you at some other time? Stick to your own routines. They're really important. Without them, it's really hard to grow your business. How about this guy? James Corden, right? What does he advertise? Sorry? What's the website? <laughs> well, his advertising clearly isn't working. I need to have a word with him about that. Anybody? Confused.com. Yes. Now, when lettings agents are a little bit confused, what do they tend to do? They look for answers. But actually, that's not the key thing. The key thing is to understand the right questions for your industry. And not enough people understand that. Don't look for the details. Ask yourself, what are the strategically important questions I need to ask for my industry? And if you don't know, ask somebody. Don't have, have the industry act on you, act on your industry. But you can't do that if you're not thinking about the right things. Okay, valleys of death. This is termed by a guy called Vern Harnish. Vern wrote The Rockefeller Habits. If you haven't read it, it's a great read. Um, and he also wrote Scaling Up, which is a great book for the slightly bigger businesses. So if you've got two branches, yeah, go for, go for Scaling Up. Here's the first one. Not growing enough leaders. Not growing enough leaders. Why? Because you can't break through the second brick wall if you don't grow enough leaders. So they go into the valley of death and start to stagnate because the leader can't grow it anymore. They've reached the limit of personal capacity. Make sense? Second one, this is harder. I'm not an IT guy, but if you don't scale your infrastructure with your business, again, you're going to have growing pains. What happens is you end up with people doing workarounds. The Excel spreadsheets take longer. People can't get hold of information, so they make uninformed decisions. So you end up losing the advantage of scale because you're buried in inefficiency. And again, if you don't know the answers, go find what other people are doing. Nobody yet really believes that their IT is a competitive advantage, so go find out what other people are doing to scale their infrastructure. What is their phone system cost? How does it work? Who's on VoIP versus landline versus mobile? Because some of these systems are really expensive, so you might spend a lot of money when you don't need to. So will your infrastructure survive? If you've been victim of a cyber attack, who's taking care of that? What's your policy on clicking on links? Who's protecting your database? Do you let employees? Does your um, contract of employment say no competition? You only one letting agent. I haven't worked with them very long. Talked about these two great girls in his office that were absolutely amazing. And then they left with his database. I'm like, how did that happen? What about your contract of employment? He said, oh, they didn't want to sign a contract of employment. And I said, so how come they were able to walk away with all your customers? And he said, well, the customers said that they were amazing and I wasn't. So these two women had joined his business with the sole purpose of stealing his database. And he, being the muggins, had let them. So they were really great, very enthusiastic, looked after everything those landlords wanted. So created a huge difference in their minds between the service they had been getting and the service these ladies were delivering. And then once they'd got enough of a rapport, they moved and set up their own business. Nothing he could do. And he lost his whole business overnight. So make sure your infrastructure is secure and your contracts are secure and your IT is secure. Banks will brief you on this stuff. There's loads of information about how not to fall victim to fraud and to crime. Yeah, as well as preparing your business for growth. I've got one client whose IT guy is some chap in a shed. Now they're, you know, twice as big, they're really struggling. I said, well, I know you like the guy, and I know he's a friend, but when he's on holiday, you can't wait for a new server to be put in until he comes back from holiday. You need it now. What are you doing? Well, I don't want to upset him. It's like you've got a two million pound business dependent on a guy literally in a wooden shed. You must be mad. So remember, you've got to scale up as you scale up. Okay. 
This one's killed more big companies than anything else. Not reading the market. Marks and Spencers, anybody? Woolworths, Blockbuster, you name them, all gone. Because they didn't read the market. They didn't see how the world was changing. And your world's changing just as much as my world is changing. What do you need to know to make informed decisions? Where is that information going to get to you? Who can teach you? What do you need to pay attention to? What are the opportunities that Brexit or non-Brexit is going to provide to you? A lot of headless chickens at the moment. Yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunity in business and in property if you've got your head screwed on. So, lunchtime. Last thought. From what you've heard today, which is the thing that most applies to you? If you had to take one thing away to work on, what would it be? Please write it down before you go for lunch. Just write it down. We'll, we'll 30 seconds, write it down. What's that one thing that you need to take away today to work on? I'll take my duck back now. You're good at this, aren't you? You like ducks? Yeah, I like that. Everybody got something? Anybody like to share what they've got? If they think it's the roving, oh shit, uh, roving mic. Or is everybody just too hungry and wants to go to lunch? Oh, we've got one at the back. Go on, Adam. Two at the back. Communicate to the team more regularly. Say to the microphone. Sorry. Communicate to the team more regularly, daily. Good stuff. Anyone else? Never. Oh, DC. I need to confront my staff issues. Because I've got people in the business that don't need to be in the business. Yeah. Yeah, be brave. It's a good job that we've got JP talking about staff later, aren't we, JP? <laughs> Sack the bastards. No, uh, who else? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure Sorry. that's his message. I don't think you should put that on film. Who else? Oh, oh Brian. On, Brian. Yeah, I think the thing I'll take away is just building the A players. Um, you know, getting those future leaders in place and training them, getting them to buy into the vision and all that. So that's yeah. good. Okay, cool. I would certainly recommend that you talk to Paul Clark um, because he, I think, well, we can both agree, Paul, he's changed your life as well, hasn't he? And your team's lives as well, hasn't he? It's a work in progress, isn't it, mate? Yeah, he's also made me take an old motorbike apart in my garage. So, <laughs> you know, his skills are unknown, really. He's, he calls himself an engineer, give him a screwdriver and a spanner and he's mental, but there we go. But yes, he does change you, uh, he changes your view on things and makes you look at yourself and again, keeps you accountable, which is the boss somebody needs to. And Paul is a classic C-type uh, on disc profile and most of you in this room are classic C-types. You're precise, detail orientated, you don't like criticism. Um, yeah, that's you, so uh, talk, talk to Paul. Right, anything else, uh, JC? Oh, just it took me ages to clean my fingernails last night there and this go, that's morning what sort after of stripping for. that motorbike. Right, anyway, uh, it's five past, five past one now. I'd like you back here at 13.45. You're at the Brasserie uh, Restaurant downstairs. Uh, chat, liaise, and I'll see you back here later. Thank you.